topic study last week. I hope he did a pretty good job. He usually does. Now, I don't know if he had said what I said. But I wanted to do a study uh, for us uh, here in this family on encouragement. Encouraging each other. Uh, This world is... Our country, let's go ahead and just narrow it down to our country. Our country is, is, is heading down a road where we need to be able to encourage each other because it is pretty bleak when you start watching the news, <clears throat> watching CNN, watching Fox, watching just the evening news. Um, it just, it's a downer. <laughs> it, it just... It'll put you in a bad mood. I'm, I've gone to not watching the news a lot anymore but because I, I don't like going to sleep in a bad mood. Or it usually sometimes gets me in a worse mood and then I can't go to sleep because I'm thinking about it. We have got to be a people of encouragement. We're, we're in this thing together. God has put us here and, and He has told us to meet together and to take care of each other. And so I wanted to do a study on encouragement. And last week, um, Ron covered, I hope, 1 Samuel 20 and 1 Samuel 23 and Romans 12. Uh, And I just want to real quickly re-look at those. So if we go to Romans 12... And if you'll notice, I'm going to try each week to uh, have down in the corner uh, what we're going to cover next week. So you can write it down maybe and, and, and look it up and, and kind of have your mind already headed where, where we're going to talk about. But Romans 12 last week, um, I'm going to start verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophecy, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouragement, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now, I hope Ron... <clears throat> talked with you and, and discussed with you and, and asked you if encouraging is not your gift, do you still have to do it? Because I, I think some people have used this scripture right here and say, well, I, I'm really not good at it, so I really don't have to do it. Well, let me throw this at you. At the very end, it says, if it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So does that mean if, if my gift is not giving out mercy, forgiving people, <laughs> does that mean I'm not supposed to do that? And so we can't use this scripture as an excuse to not do something, right? So how, how, do, we, how do we deal with this if it's not my gift? If your gift is not to teach, you know, you just, I mean, you're not a very good teacher. You can't get up here and do what I'm doing. That's not your gift. So does that mean you don't, you don't have to teach at all? Go ahead, Roxy. Ah, you don't get to encourage. Right. Of course, you know where I'm going with this. This list in Romans 12 does not mean, does not give us uh, an out. It doesn't give us uh, a, an excuse to not be the Christ-like person he has called us to be. Encouragement could be 
No words at all, just a hug. And don't tell me you can't hug somebody. Well, I just don't like touching other people. Well, then pat them on the back. Give them, give them a look of, I'm with you. Maybe say a couple of words, you're in my prayers. Everybody can encourage. And I want you to put yourself on the other side of the equation. When you are down on your knees, hurting so bad, and nobody comes and gives you an encouraging word or a hug or a pat, how do you feel? And do you want to be a part of a church? Do you want to be a part of a family of believers that meet in this building? Do you want, be, do you want to be a part of this family here and it's not an encouraging family? I bet you that if you're down on your knees hurting and nobody from this family encourages you, you probably won't come to church here anymore or want to be a part of this family here anymore. What do you think? You wouldn't feel like part of the family. Romans 12, Romans 12 is a, a, a scripture that reinforces you've got something, get out and use it. But every one of us can teach. Every one of us can encourage. Every one of us can um, contribute to the needs of others. Every one of us can do everything listed in here. The measure at which I'm able to do it might be different than yours. But man, let us not ever become a family that doesn't encourage each other. And if you look in 1 Samuel 20 and 23, it's talking about the relationship between Jonathan and David. David has not ascended to the throne. Jonathan is next in line behind his dad Saul. And these two scriptures talk about how Jonathan, pardon me, how David has been run out of the city by Saul. And Jonathan still meets with him secretly and encourages him and tells him, I'm not going to be the next king, David. You are. And you have my blessing, and you have my encouragement, and you have my support because you're going to be the next king. And he encourages David when David is in a low place. Everything's gone wrong for him. And Jonathan, the son of the king, encourages him about it. And so it's very needed. Now, let's come to today's. Have you ever had someone trying to encourage you and they just didn't have the right words? They just said it all wrong. Did that ever happen? A lot of times it happens at funerals. Someone has passed. You have to pick your words very carefully when someone has lost a loved one. And especially if someone has lost a child. I don't think it'd be a good thing to say they're in a better place. God wanted his little angel to come home. Ooh. 
A lot of times when someone has passed, all I say is, I'm hurting with you. And I give them a hug. That's a very safe thing to say. Because hopefully you are hurting with them. But don't try to explain what's going on. Or if someone's having a tough time, maybe at work, maybe at church, anything, and and you say, oh, well, this will just blow right on by. Well, right now, it's not blowing right by. (laughs) I'm just in a pretty terrible mood, and right now, it's not blowing by. It's right here in my face. Choosing the right words. We've got to learn how to encourage and say the right words because we don't want to be hurtful. And sometimes it's a fine line. Well, let's look at this. Proverbs chapter 12, chapter 16, and chapter 25. Let's look at those real quick. I think you know what these say before we even go there. And I'm in 1 Samuel. That's not Proverbs, is it? Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Got to go through my Bible class song. Proverbs 12, verse 5. Is that right? No, 25. Woo. An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word does what to him? Makes him glad. What's another way it says? Happy. Cheers him up. Kind words. Now, sometimes I'm not wanting to say kind words to somebody. But is there a way I can turn my words to where they're kind as well as what needs to be said? But how many of us, and I'm raising my hand because back in my coaching days, whoo, man, some stuff came out of my mouth before it it processed up here. And they were not kind words. And they were biting words. And they were tearing to help, (coughs) excuse me, tearing down words, and sometimes to my athletes, to children, to kids, to teenagers. Man, we, got, we need to process what's going on to turn our words into kind words, yet we can still get the point across. And that usually happens when we slow down and when Craig slows down and processes it first. Processes first. Let's go to chapter 16. Verse 24. For those of you who are way on the wings and can't read my board. <clears throat> Alvin. 1624. Pleasant words are a honeycomb. Sweet To what? Sweet to what? Where's the soul? Down deep inside of somebody. Pleasant words are sweet all the way to the core of a person. And healing to the what? To the bones. And where are your bones? At the center of your body, correct? Pleasant words are sweet and healing all the way to the inmost part of people. And so my point is how important it is to watch what we say. And the words that we use when we're trying to encourage someone. Because a wrong word will damage the deep inner part of the person you're trying to encourage or talk to. Well, then I want to kind of 
switch it up here and go to 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter three. <laughs> Starting in verse sixteen. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good word. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 2. Paul is telling Timothy these things. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now, my question is, can rebuking and correcting be encouraging? But it's hard. When I need to be corrected, when I need to be rebuked, and someone approaches me to do that, what's our natural instinct? I become defensive. I build a wall real quick. It's amazing how quick we build those walls. Boom. Did Jesus rebuke? Did Jesus correct? Look at his apostles. And look at specifically one apostle. What's his name? Peter. <laughs> Peter's foot was in his mouth a lot, wasn't it? And one time, Jesus rebuked him very harshly, didn't he? Get behind me, not Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Now, I think that is one of the most revealing things about encouragement and rebuking or correcting. Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan, not Peter. Because Jesus knew who Peter was listening to or reacting with, and that was Satan. And how many times do we do that? We start reacting and we start doing things that Satan is telling us to do. And how many times do we... And sometimes we don't. I've been really bad in my past, and I'm going to put it out there that probably a lot of us have been this way in our past, that we don't like confrontation, so I'm not going to talk to that person about it, even though they need to be corrected. Because it, it puts tension in the room, doesn't it? Ha! Ah, we don't like tension. We don't like confrontation. And so we're not even going to talk to them. 
But if we ever got the strength enough to go and confront someone about sin or something wrong in their life, um, how many times do we say, you need to do that, and you need to do that, and, and we really need to say, you know, Satan's, uh, Satan's got a hold of you. And we've got to throw Satan out instead of going, you, you, you. And I've done that. I have gone to someone and you really need to change the way you're living. You're, you're making some poor decisions in your life. Instead of getting to the point of, you know, Satan is, is really working right now in this situation. And I'm here to help you, and I'm, I'm here so that we can work together, so we can get Satan behind us. Instead of just jabbing, jabbing, pointing the finger, pointing the finger, come in there as a helper, as an encourager for someone to correct behavior. Saying the right words. Get behind me, Satan. We are called to hate the sin, but love the person who is in sin, right? And I think for too long, I, and maybe some of you, have been guilty of putting out where it looks like we hate the person too and the sin. By the way we say things. Oh, it's so important how we say things to encourage someone to get their life right. It is so important that we say the right words. And it all has to be dripping with love. It has to be dripping with the voice of Jesus through us. Because we are called to be Jesus here now, aren't we? We have to be Jesus to people. Rebuking, correcting, and encouraging. And I think he, right here where he's talking to Timothy in, in chapter 4, with great what? I lied before that, girlfriend. Before that. It is chapter 4, isn't it? Yeah. In verse, uh, right at the very end, but before the careful instruction. Now, just because I rebuked her, she was wrong. That y'all, y'all, don't be scared to say something, <laughs> Sandra. <laughs> no, you're wrong, Sandra. The one before it. <laughs> With great what? Patience. How many of you all have struggled with patience in dealing with other people? Roxy, you teacher, you. <laughs> yeah, if you've been in the classroom, oh, my land. Come, come around March, April, and May, your patience is here with those kids. I'm ready to kill them. With great patience, before there is also great instruction and careful instruction, careful words. With great patience. How patient is Jesus with us? How patient was Jesus with Peter? Oh, my land. And I'm so happy Peter did not turn away and just say, I'm done. Because it seems like Jesus was always correcting him, right? Doesn't it seem that? Peter, do something. Peter, you're just messing up. 
And you just keep messing up. Even to the final hours in the garden, what does Peter do? He messes up. <laughs> and when the rooster crowed three times, and Peter had even messed up one more last time, he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. But he knew the patience of Jesus, didn't he? And how patient is Jesus with us? The same way. The same way. And that needs to be in our mind when we go to encourage someone. Especially if we're trying to correct and rebuke. It is so important to remember how patient Jesus is with me. I must reflect that same patience with the person I'm trying to correct and rebuke. And it will be an encouragement then. It will be an encouragement as well as a lesson for them in the way that I approach them. And it's so, so important. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. The Hebrew writer gets pretty strong about this subject here in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Now, he's getting kind of pointed right here. You think you're struggling with sin? You haven't got to the point to where people are hurting you physically. All righty. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. All right. Now, the Hebrew writer says, this is encouragement to you. This is encouragement. And then he quotes Proverbs chapter 3. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? The word of encouragement that is that addresses you as sons. This was a word of encouragement to people who were going through some tough times. God has not left you. Your Father has not left you. And it's a word of encouragement. And I want us to turn this around to where we do the same thing. Giving words of encouragement to those who need corrected. And it makes it so much easier. Yes, there probably will still be tension in the room. But that tension can be alleviated. Ooh, what a big word I just used. (laughs) That tension can be drained away with love. Right, Sandra? That tension can be completely melted away with a spirit and a heart of love in our encouragement. 
while we are correcting and rebuking. And how you choose the words you use will determine how quick the tension melts away. And there's so many ways that you can use your words to build up as you are correcting and rebuking. And it always helps. This is just Craig's little tidbit, okay? Take it or leave it, throw it out, whatever. But this is Craig's little tidbit. If you tell the person and you truly mean it, that you're there to walk with them, which is what a family's supposed to do, how encouraging will that be? To tell someone, you don't have to walk this road by yourself. I'm there for you. And then you have to be there for them. That is what community of faith, that is what family of faith, that is what the church is supposed to do. And I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about us in the building. That is what we are called to do. To walk with each other through the hard times. Through the Satan's hammering us on the head. Through the correcting of each other. Through the rebuking of each other. Through the helping each other through the, a death, a close person who has died, we are told to walk with each other and just let somebody know and then be there for them. Don't just give them hollow words. I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you. Share each other's joys. Share each other's disappointments and hurts. And how encouraging will that be? And you think of that person who didn't say the right words, but you knew their heart. And even though it stung at first, <laughs> you just go, I know they meant well, it's just their mouth got in the way. <laughs> And those of us, Sandra, Craig, I won't call anybody else. I just know I can, I'm safe with Sandra. But those of us who are mouthy, <laughs> those of us who are mouthy, those of us who really put ourselves out there, and, and Sandra and I do that, we put our foot in our mouths a lot of times. And so I ask for your forgiveness and your mercy on me and to please see past my mouth and see my heart. <laughs> I'm trying to encourage you, <laughs> even though sometimes it doesn't work because my mouth gets in the way. But like I said earlier, sometimes... It doesn't have to be a word. It's just the presence. It's the tap on the shoulder. It's the hug. It's the hold the hand and squeeze it a little bit. That's all it takes. And I want us to be a people who do that. I want this family here that meets in this to be Jesus to others, which means we are encouragers. Jesus knew back in then, and he knows now how tough it is in this life, on this earth. He knows how tough it is. But he has showed us how to encourage each other. And that's one of the reasons, and we'll talk about it more later, that's one of the reasons why we meet on Sunday mornings. That's why we meet in life groups. That's why we meet 
on Wednesday nights so that whoever can make it can come in here and get encouraged. That's our purpose. That's part of our purpose. Matthew 12. Let's get there. And then we'll call the end. And then next week we'll study Acts 4, 2 Corinthians 8, and Acts 11. And probably maybe some others that I sometimes come up with as I study. But let's look at Matthew 12. And this is very sobering in our study about using the right words in our encouragement. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 Well, I'm, I'm going to go up to the middle. Uh, um, I'm going to start in verse 34. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, but he's also talking to us. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? So that's, that's number one. You need to get stuff going in yourself that's good, right? And not evil. That's the first thing that's got to happen in this encouraging thing. You got to get stuff in you right. But here we go. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment. For every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Is that not sobering? And this isn't talking about cussing or using the Lord's name in vain. This is beyond that. This is how are we using our words to encourage or to tear down. And I will be one of the first to admit my words have torn some people down in my past. And I hope and I pray for forgiveness from the person that I hurt and from God. That's what I hope and pray for. Because I will have to give an account of the words I use. And I pray that Jesus and the Holy Spirit will help me use my words to encourage, not to tear down. And that's what this study is all about. For us to be encouragers, not tearers down. I hope you were blessed this morning. We're now going to meet and worship God as a group and pray and sing. So let's worship God at this time. Thank you all so much for being here to study God's Word.